Joseph, moving at a pretty good pace, I think, so far. Um, and uh, we, we find him in the pit. Remember that the prison is called a pit, which reminds us of the story of his enslavement, right? When his brothers put him into a pit. And it's the story of exile. Here, he, he is at the end of his exile, right? This is the, the lowest that he will get. To the point that, spoiler alert, at the end of the story, he is forgotten. Right? And it's going to be a, a major theme in it. So Genesis 40, I'll try to get there myself. Um, here, Joseph is going to interpret uh, a pair of dreams. Uh, so let's start in the first eight verses here. Sometime after this, the cupbearer of the king of Egypt and his baker committed an offense against their lord, king of Egypt. And Pharaoh was angry with his two officers and the chief cupbearer and the chief baker. And he put them in custody in the house of the captain of the guard in the prison where Joseph was confined. The captain of the guard appointed Joseph to be with them. He attended them. They continued for some time in custody. And one night they both dreamed, the cupbearer and the baker of the king of Egypt, who were confined in prison, each his own dream and each dream with its own interpretation. When Joseph came to them in the morning, he saw that they were troubled. So he asked Pharaoh's officers who were with him in custody in his master's house, Why are your faces downcast today? They said to him, We have had dreams, and there is no one to interpret them. And Joseph said to them, Do not interpretations belong to God? Please tell them to me. Here we see dreams are given uh, to Joseph. I want you to consider for, for a minute how unlikely it is that you have met the people in your life that you have met. And this is across the board. This could be your spouse. This could be uh, 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 friends, co-workers, neighbors. I mean, think about it. That, that the chances of uh, two people meeting in a, in a world of 7, 8 billion people really is quite, quite phenomenal. Uh, and if you think about it too much, I, I think you will conclude that there is something providential about who God puts in our lives. I mean, just for you to meet your spouse is pretty incredible. Maybe you met your spouse at college, and you, you think, what are the chances that this person who I've dedicated my life to, we chose the same college? For man and I, we met at vacation Bible school. What are the chances, even in a small town um, with about 500 students or less in that high school, that her two best friends uh, were active members of our youth group? What are the chances of that? She, she could have had friends with anyone else, gone to any other church, because I hadn't met her even at the small school. I hadn't ran into her yet as far as I knew. Uh, what are the chances of some of this stuff? That is really a arc that we see in the story of Joseph. After all, at the end of the story, he'll say to his brothers, what you meant for evil, God meant for good. And what we find is that Joseph could have been executed by Potiphar. Instead, he's imprisoned. He's not just imprisoned anywhere. He's in prison where Pharaoh puts his prisoners, which means... Uh, of all the prisons Joseph could have been in, uh, he is put in a prison where two prominent figures will come and have a dream on the same night, very similar dreams, and that here is this guy who we already know in the narrative can interpret dreams, and he's given that opportunity. What are the chances of that? Well, we see in verse 1, Joseph is about 28 years old. He is two years out from interpreting Pharaoh's dreams. Uh, and I was thinking about that because I find young men, this is a, an issue that most young men will come and I've talked to several, around age 30, I think most young men have done this, um, is age 30 is a bit of a crisis. Because you look back and your 20s are gone. I didn't know if you knew if that's how numbers worked or not. Um, but you get to your 30s and you think, my best years are behind me. And, and you feel like you've wasted your 20s. It, it is for a lot of young men, it's a crisis. You think, now that I'm 30, because you think 30 is older than what it actually is, um, I'm, I'm, I'm knock, knock, knocking on 40's door right now, and suddenly 40 don't seem so old. But um, uh, a lot of men at age 30 think, I've wasted my 20's, and now I'm far behind my peers. Um, and that's not really the case. Men hit their peak between ages of 40 and 50, by the way. If you don't believe me, uh, do, do the research. Uh, how old do you think are the world's most best-looking men are? They're all in their 40's, right? Every actor, they're in their 40s. They're not 22-year-old studs, right? No one cares about them, right? right? Right, ladies, right? I mean, you didn't know who Brad Pitt was till he hit 40, right? You know, either that or Fight Club. Either way, you know, um, but Joseph is, is going to be 30 years old when he finally uh, gets released uh, out of prison. Well, we, we meet both the chief cupbearer and the chief baker, and both verses 1 and 2 repeat those titles, 
is not just that it's the cupbearer and a baker, it's that it's the chief cupbearer, the chief baker. We meet the uh, baker first, and uh, I don't know if you know this or not, but the White House has a chief baker, uh, chief chef, or whatever it is you, you want to call it. We'll, we'll uh, call them a chief baker for our purposes. Her name is Christetta Comforford. I'm sure I'm mispronouncing that name terribly. And she's been in that row since 2005, which means she has served under uh, President Bush, Obama, Trump, and now Biden. So four presidents that she's, she, she has served under. Um, and I assume that row requires a very detailed background check. I'm just <coughs> guessing, right? Because you, you think that the person feeding the president should be someone who's very trustworthy. Uh, and not just the president, but everyone in the White House. Like the vice president and their families, uh, the secretary of state, the you know all of them, right? That 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 person is. Uh, we don't think about them much, but sort of an important role, and everyone they hire and all of that sort of stuff. Uh, and I'm sure that's that's no different than it was in the ancient world. Then there's the chief cupbearer. Uh, they cupbearers show up uh, occasionally in the Bible. This is the first one we meet, I believe. Um, and initially, their job is. They, they pour the king's drinks, and they'll hand it to them. That'll come back later on in, in, in this chapter. That role eventually be, takes on a role of adva advisory. Often they're considered almost like uh, uh, a, a, a political role, even governors, right? So if, if you have the trust of the king, and the king sees in you competence and, and integrity— uh, it's very possible. Not only is that an advisory robe, but it, it could become a gubernatorial robe. Uh, an example of this would be Nehemiah. When Nehemiah um, is having a bad day, the king wants to know, oh, no, would you eat? Because I ain't eating, right? But also, he, he, he carries a lot of weight in the administration. So this is the chief cupbearer. And we don't know what happened to them. For some reason, they are in prison. I wonder if... If whatever has happened to them may be similar to what has happened to Joseph, one, of course, will be found guilty. The other will be found innocent. And one wonders maybe if one is falsely accused, the innocent, um, and maybe the one is, is, was rightly accused. I don't know. We, we're just not given this, this detail. But nevertheless, here they are, and they just so happen to be sent to the same prison as uh, Joseph. Um, and we see this little detail. The captain of the guard... Uh, has Joseph to take care of them. Now, who is this cat? I never uh, thought of this, and I never really considered this. It is very possible, and I think the text leans in this direction. The captain of the guard that assigns Joseph to these men is likely Potiphar. N notice the language. Um, I got him up here. Genesis 37, um, the Midianites sell Joseph to a man named Potiphar, described as the captain of the guard. In chapter 39, he again is called the captain of the guard. So by chapter 40, when you see the phrase and there's no other context given, the presumption is that the identity of the captain of the guard has already been given. Therefore, this is who he is. Which means Joseph is, is, is not just a prisoner, he is still a slave. He is still under the, the thumb of Potiphar, even in prison. He's being punished for something he, of course, didn't do. Uh, but he is still under the rule of Potiphar. I, I just find that fascinating. never noticed that uh, before. Well, after, uh, 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 after all this, um, both men uh, happen to experience memorable dreams in need of interpretations. Now, we, we've talked about this before. In Joseph... There are three pairs of dreams, right? And they always come in two. So Joseph, um, remember that he had two dreams with one meaning in Genesis 37. Here you have two dreams with one similar meaning, though the application is different. Later, Pharaoh will have two dreams with one meaning. But they're always in pairs, these dreams. And in Egypt, the, the dreams were really important. We dabble in this as Americans, right? Um, every once in a while, someone will ask me what I think about their dreams. And I'll usually say, I, I, I just don't know. Like, 
dreams are in the Bible. I get that. Uh, God had, you know, reveals things through these dreams, particularly the story of Joseph, later Daniel, really the two main ones. Uh, but, but it is my rule of thumb that if it is clearly laid out in Scripture, I should probably not say a whole lot. You know? So uh, that's, that's where I leave it. That seems to be a, a safer place uh, to be. But the Egyptians obsessed over it. Uh, if they ever had a memorable dream like this, and you know what I'm talking about, right? Like, I've had dreams, and I woke up from them, and within an hour, I can't. You know, by the time you get around to tell your, your, your loved ones, you won't believe the dream I had last night. It was, um, you were in it. I don't remember anything else, right? You, you, you've had that experience, right? And then there are some dreams where you, you just, you cannot shake it for nothing, all right? And that's what these two dreams are. And what the Egyptians had was they had official interpreters. And they believed these dreams were uh, the supernatural world or even the, uh, the world of the dead speaking to the living, uh, to the physical world. Uh, they, could, they could protect the future. Often they did. And so if dreams could do this, it was imperative that you went to someone who could help you understand those dreams. So, so here we have someone of all the Hebrews, right? He's the only one that we've seen so far who, who seems to have this unique gift given to him by God. These guys have a dream while they are in uh, under the, the, the care of, of, of Joseph. Well, there's some irony here. The first set of dreams was all about Joseph being exalted, but it leads to his downfall. Here we see another pair of dreams that will lead to his uh, elevation. All right. So they are key to, to the story. Um, and one gets the feeling that these two men have discussed these dreams. Um, they both are aware they had similar dreams on the same night, so I think there's no, uh, this isn't coincidence. And so it says they, that, that the men are troubled. Uh, the word means to, to fret, to be sad, to be vexed. They don't really know what to do with, with this. Maybe you, you've had those sort of dreams before. Um, and translations struggle with the exact word. So I'm going to throw these uh, up here. Um, here's how uh, so mine, the ESV says trouble. Uh, I, I, I assume your translation is up there, although I didn't get the message. I didn't think about that. That would have been fun. Um, but uh, the, the old King James, the ones that predate them, all say sad. That's not a very poetic or rich word, um, but it's, it's stronger than just being sad. Distraught a good word. Uh, upset, troubled, dejected. You can, you can see the idea of, of what is going on here. Um, and Joseph realizes this. And uh, remember, he is their attendant. He's responsible for them. So he asked, why are your faces downcast? Now, that word downcast is an interesting word. The word means bad. It's the word in the Garden of Eden, the tree of the knowledge of good and bad. It's the same word. Now, now the word, uh, much like in English, it can have you know stronger or less strong uh, meanings. But... Here, it's, it's, it's the idea not that, that their faces are bad or evil, but that their countenance has fallen. Uh, they're, they're nervous. They're scared. Um, that sort of thing. Um, and so Joseph tells them, um, well, I know that had this happened before you came to prison, you had access to all Pharaoh's interpreters. Well, now, now you don't have access to them. You're in prison. Well, good luck. or, or I, have, I have good news for you. And that is that interpretations don't come from them. If God gives you a dream, God will give the interpretation of what he says. And, and you are in luck, he says. I'm your guy, basically, right? Again, what are the chances of that? Well, then starting in verse 9, we, we get the interpretations of them. Um, so the chief cupbearer told his dream to Joseph and said to him, In my dream there was a vine before me, and on the vine there were three branches. As soon as it budded, it blossomed, shot forth, the clusters ripened in the grapes. Pharaoh's cup was in my hand, and I took the grapes and pressed them into the Pharaoh's cup and placed the cup in Pharaoh's hand. That imagery will show up again. Then Joseph said to him, This is its interpretation. The three branches are three days. In three days Pharaoh will lift up your head. And restore you to your office, and you shall place Pharaoh's cup in his hand, as formerly when you were his cupbearer. Only remember me when it is well with you. Please do me the kindness to mention me to Pharaoh, and so get me out of this house. For I was indeed stolen out of the land of Hebrews, and here also I have done nothing that they should put me into the pit. There, there's that phrase. It's a pit. It's a prison, yes, but, but the, the metaphor of the pit runs throughout the Bible. It's, it's a type of death. It's a grave. It's... Um, you know, it's, it's the pit. 
Uh, we'll pause there. Dream interpretation was big business in Egypt. I'll never forget when I worked at the, at the Christian bookstore in Louisville. Um, I worked in the back, but on this, uh, on this day, I, I was out, out with, with everyone else for whatever reason. And this lady comes in. She goes, do you all have tarot cards? Now, I didn't really know what a tarot card was, right? I'm just a naive 20-year-old kid, okay? And I go, we got, like, greeting cards and stuff like that. We even have, they call them pass them on cards, you know? That cute little picture on it says, God bless you and loves you, whatever it is. And they're like 15 cents. You can buy them in bulk, you know? And she goes, okay, show me those. And I show them, she said, that's not what I'm looking for. And all the other staff knew what a, a, a tarot card was, and they're laughing at me the whole time, right? <laughs> And, and the issue was there was a new age store. You, you may know this, Don, knowing the area, kind of across the street from us. And and because we're not going to say, hey, there's like the witches are all across the street. We're, you know, we're not going to say that. Um, and so I'm just, I'm just, you know, when she left, they told me like, oh yeah, yeah, I, I, I just walked right into that. Um, but but like that, this is a big business. And and uh, what we have, is he here? Mark. Mm -hmm. no. um, so, what? Thanks to archaeology and historical research, one of the things that we we know is we we've seen how the Egyptians interpret dreams. This is fascinating. Uh, when it comes to the dreams, we're looking for these four things. Okay. Now, I'm talking about Egyptian dreams. I'm not talking about your dreams. Don't come afterwards and say I had a dream about you know um, I don't know dead presidents or something. Not, I, I I don't know what to do with that. But when the Egyptians interpreted Egyptian dreams, this is, these are the four things you're looking for. I'm getting this from a commentary. I trust he's right. The dream, the dreamer sees himself in the dream, right? Uh, the dream predicts the future. Uh, the dream is allegorical in that uh, things have a meaning beyond, you know, just, just what they are. And they call it the principle of similar. For our purposes, there's, there's something ironic in it, okay? Uh, a play on words, puns, something like that, Okay. What's interesting is that these two dreams fit this pattern. Now, the reason I point this out is, is because, you know, like everyone else, I want to know, is the Bible true? Is the Bible reliable? And one of the things you'll find in the latter half of Genesis and, and, and Exodus is when you're in Egypt, there is, is clear influence of Egyptian society in it. For example, in the story of Moses, Egyptian words are inserted in the narrative. Now, they are transliterated into Hebrew, but they are Egyptian words. And a lot of people say that the Torah, the first five books of the Bible, was written centuries later after the Babylonian captivity. And one of the problems with that is if you just came out of Babylon and you're trying to you know, rebuild uh, Israel, you are not familiar with ancient Egyptian culture to insert these details. But if the story's Genesis goes all the way back to its beginning, then it makes sense that, that we would find these patterns because these are Egyptian men, and we, they have Egyptian dreams, and they follow an Egyptian pattern. It's as if the writer understood Egyptian culture, and I, I think they did. I, I think the Torah is written by Big M. Moses and Little M. Moses. I do think there's later editors, and we could chase that rabbit at a, at a later time. So let me show you how the, the cupbearer's dream fits this pattern. The first one... The cupbearer sees himself uh, before the vine and holding uh, the Pharaoh's uh, cup, right? So verses 9 and 11, you'll see that. He sees himself in the dream. It is prophetic. After all, verse 13, in three days, he will be restored. His head will be lifted up. We talked about that. There's, your head is lifted up, exaltation. Your head is lifted down, exile, into the, death, into the pit, death. It is allegorical, right? Notice the emphasis on three uh, on the number three. There are three branches, which represent three days, the allegory. Uh, notice the word pharaoh and cup are used three times each in verse 11, right? So, so clearly there's allegory here. And then notice the, the idiom uh, that's idiomatic. The phrase lifting up someone's head is used elsewhere in the ancient world, even in the Bible. And I took out the reference for sake of time. To indicate the restoration of one's fortunes. Your head has been lifted up. Well, not literally. I'm not grabbing them by the hair and yanking them out of the prison. But it's, it's, it's idiomatic. It's, it's somewhat punny, right? It, 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 it has, has it's, it's more than, it's not literal, I guess I should say. So, um, but I want you to notice what Joseph does. Verses 14 and 15. 
is that usually when someone interprets a dream, they get paid for it. Now, that's a business I want to be involved in because I'm convinced. This is going to sound bad. If it's good enough, people are, vulnerable, are, are, are gullible enough, you can talk them into anything. Right? I love to do this with art. You, I, I've, I've joked about this before. Um, I took one of our members, uh, we, we did an event, we were standing at a hotel, and um, jokingly, I, I went to all, hotel arts the worst. And, and I, my wife hates it. The kids won't put up with it. I'll analyze the art, you know? And, and, and so, you know, this guy, this person from church, and they're like, you know, they know I'm joking. Well, um, the cleaning lady of the hotel is walking by and heard me do this. As you can see, the dark colors indicate the artist was really going through a time of loneliness and depression, but yet you'll notice the bright colors, more subtle but clear. In fact, it's the first thing your eyes come to. There is hope at the end of the tunnel, isn't it? You know, you just make it up. And, and, and the lady goes, you know, I've walked by this piece of art a hundred times every day, and I've never seen that. I'm like, you know, I do this for a living, ma'am. And, you know, of course, I repent of, of lying at, at the end, right? I think you could do that with dreams, right? You could probably make good money. I'm not advocating that. I'm just distracting myself. What were we talking about? So what Joseph does is he doesn't want money. He wants freedom. He wants exaltation. And all he asks is for the cupbearer to remember him when he stands before Pharaoh. He's appealing his case to Pharaoh. That's all he wants. I just want to be justified. Well, we get the second dream starting in verse 16. And there's a lot of parallels or, or similarities. When the chief baker saw that the interpretation was favorable, you, you can see what's happening here, right? He's like, dude, my dream was just like that. Three days I'm out of here, right? And he tells him the dream. And we, the reader, are falling for that trap, aren't we? He said to Joseph, I also had a dream. There were three cake baskets on my head. See, see the emphasis on numbers. It's allegorical. And in the uppermost basket, there were all sorts of baked food for Pharaoh, but the birds were eating out the baskets of my head. And Joseph answered and said, this is its interpretation. The three baskets are for three days. In three days, Pharaoh will lift up your head from you and hang you on a tree, and the birds will eat the flesh from you. Man, talk about being the bearer of bad news. You're not going to make a lot of money interpreting dreams with, with stuff like that. I mean, get, give me a, a few minutes and I'll come up with something better than that, right? I mean, my goodness. Um, but uh, again, however, it follows this pattern, okay? So the dreamer sees himself, right? It's, it's his, his head with the baskets, all that. Um, by the way, the word cake, does anyone, it's, it's uh, uh, what, what verse is it? I didn't write it down. Um, Verse 16, I also had a dream. There were three cake baskets. Does everyone have cake? Bread. You got bread? Okay. White. White. So you got white bread. Okay, so it's a specific type. Okay. This is one of those Hebrew words. Uh, you going to look it up in the message, Don? No. Okay. All right. Because uh, it's hard telling what old Eugene come up with. This is a Hebrew. It doesn't have that. So it may just skip this word. We don't know what this word means. So we, we take context. He's a baker. So, so we, we sort of go, go try to do something with that. Um, but one of the words it could mean is horite. It's related to the word. Uh, so, so it's just we don't know what every Hebrew word means. Context helps with this. That's just a fun little nugget. You do with that information whatever you want. It doesn't change the meaning of the text or interpretation of the dream. Joseph knew what it is he, he was talking about. But you see that uh, he sees himself. Uh, it predicts the future. In three days, he's going to be executed. Uh, it's allegorical. Emphasis on three. Uh, so the, the, the three baskets refers to three days. Judgment is rendered. It's idiomatic. The lifting off of the head will lead to his execution. Follows the same pattern that we would expect of Egyptian uh, dreams. Uh, now, the reference to birds will eat the flesh off of you. Now, every culture, that is awful. That is awful, right? Um, even now, like in our culture, if someone goes missing and all the evidence suggests that they have <coughs> passed away, okay? Um, um, I've, been, I've been watching a, 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 a true crime documentary on a case here in Kentucky where the person's gone missing. They've been declared dead. And when they interview the family, what do they say? We need closure. What does that closure mean? We need a body to bury 
Right? We, we understand this even today, right? It's for a body to be exposed is just an awful, awful thing. Um, in Egyptian culture, it's particularly awful because what are Egyptians most famous for? Mummies. You can go to the Southern Baptist Theological Seminary, and you can go to their museum, and there's a mummy there. You need to go. Now, field trip, right? What are you all doing next Wednesday? Let's go, right? So field trip. Uh, it's really cool. It's really cool. Uh, if you've not been to the museum at Southern, you really ought to go. It's not big. It's small, but uh, uh, it's a neat, neat little trip. If you're ever up there, I'll go by and see it. But there's a mummy there. Um, I, I think I've told this before. On our honeymoon, um, man and I, we were laying on the couch, and we were watching Discovery Channel. Don't judge me. Um, judge her. And um, um, there was a, a show. It was all about... Uh, live, or not live, but, but they had camera people and they found a mummy, right? They're digging in Egypt. But however, they had to get through all the stuff in the front to get to the mummy in the back. And we thought it was just one show. They get through all that, we just want to see the mummy. There's like six episodes. And we're just sitting there like, okay, we're going to see the mummy. And before every commercial, it says, when we come back, we'll open the mummy. I'm like, oh, we can sit through commercials. They're going to open the mummy. Next thing you know, when we come back, we're going to open it. Right? And I, bet, I bet we did watch three episodes at least. I'm exaggerating about six. I have tried to find this thing. Because when we went back to our honeymoon spot, I tried to find it, like on YouTube or something. I can't even find the, the show. And like, I think Discovery Channel realized what they did to us. Well, we eventually got to the mummy part. There wasn't a body in it in the coffin. It was like statues of a thing. And they're like, this is better than the mummy. Like, not to us who are watching. I want to see a mummy. Now, why do they preserve a body like that? Well, for science, you know, in the 21st century, of course. No, they do it because they're trying to preserve the body for the afterlife. So if you leave a body to be exposed, then what happens to you in the afterlife? You don't have that body anymore. This is a heinous way to go. Later, the image of your body rotting out in the open for birds to consume you is a depiction of God's judgments. Read Ezekiel and other passages of Deuteronomy would be one. So this is a, a terrible way to go. Well, what we get uh, finally in the last four verses is the dreams are fulfilled. Verse 20, on the third day, which was Pharaoh's birthday, he made a feast for all of his servants and lifted up the head of the chief cupbearer. And he lifted off the head of the chief baker among the servants. He restored the chief cupbearer to his position. He placed the cup in Pharaoh's hand. You remember that in the dream? So it's not just allegorical, that part. It, it was literal. But he hanged the chief baker as Joseph had interpreted to them. Yet the chief cupbearer did not remember Joseph but forgot him. Um, pretty straightforward. Uh, when Pharaoh had a birthday, uh, this was a big deal. Like, we don't do this with the president. I couldn't tell you when the president's birthday is. Frankly, it's not going to affect my day at all. This president or the previous president or the next, right? We don't think about that much. This would have been very different in the ancient world uh, because Pharaoh would have been viewed as a type of god. Um, and so this is a big deal. And so he's festive, which means he's going to restore someone and he's going to destroy someone, right? I mean, that's one way to party, I guess. Uh, but it's all on the same day. Three days later from when Joseph gave the interpretation, this takes place. Um, verse 23 is, is one of the key verses in this chapter. It ends on a sad note. Joseph asks for payment in one way. When you're restored, tell Pharaoh about me. And the one thing he requested, it's like the only thing he's requested in the entire story of Joseph, he's forgotten. And here the reader is just gutted for Joseph, aren't we? He doesn't belong down there. And now he's going to rot for two more years. And this guy's just going to forget about him. And, and it's as if the writer is trying to convince the, the reader God has abandoned him. And remember what we said last week, chapter 39, was for the reader to, to remember God has not forsaken Joseph. You remember at least three times it was there. God was with Joseph in the pit. God was with Joseph in the prison. God was with Joseph. And here you get to the end, you're thinking, I thought God was with Joseph. All he has to do is whisper in the dude's ear, remember Joseph, and be on with it. But when you look at the cupbearer as being indebted to him or being paid by him or as 
his doings had got so devout that it died behind him. You know what I'm saying? Say it again. Well, it would be an independent thanks of Joseph that God was the one <coughs> brought him out, not the cupbearer or the baker or anybody else. Yeah, you're right. Joseph is going to discover, because he'll say this, well, you meant for evil, God meant for good. And where the cupbearer was negligent, God still worked through it. Now, the cupbearer remembers. It just takes him two years. It's sort of like the joke um, of the husband who says to his wife, Honey, um, I wish you would just stop reminding me. You don't need to tell me every six months to do it, right? You know, um, He will remember in the next chapter. It just takes two years. But Joseph, through that process, discovers it's really God that exalts him. And one of the beautiful things, the way the story is written, is you get to the end of the story and you think uh, it's all bad news. It's just more bad news, exile, 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 exile. However, the interpretation of the dreams is important. Remember, there's three sets of dreams. This is the second, the middle set. The first set, we don't know if Joseph is interpreting it right or wrong. Because after all, I believe every dream I have is for my good and glory, don't you? <laughs> right? I can interpret to make where I look like the good guy. But now that he's interpreted a set of dreams accurately, we go back to those first dreams and we realize Joseph is going to be exalted. It looks impossible for us now. But clearly he's no fool. And God has given him this gift. And it makes the reader want to keep reading this is a great way to end, end, end a story, right? My wife is, we're going to get to Jesus. My wife is the world's worst of this. Um, when we watch, we're, we're almost done with our, with our most recent series, right? Uh, technically we are, but I'm, I'm not going to chase that around. Um, every episode ends with the cliffhanger, you know? You know? And, and even before you go to commercial, it's got a bit of the cliffhanger in it. And so my wife's terrible about this. She... She, 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 when she gets into it, she could just keep going because, well, like, I don't know what's going to happen next, you know? And so she has to go to bed early for school. And she said, well, let's just watch one episode. Okay. And it gets to the end, and it's got the cliffhanger. And, and I said, okay, well, we're going, well, what if we just watch the first part of the next episode? <laughs> right? Okay. Okay. And, and we do. And, and I, I, I've got more self-restraint than she does. So I, I go ahead and hit pause. Right? I've learned not to close out of it. I hit pause and said, okay, let's go to bed. She said, well, we could do another 10 minutes, you know, and we'll do that for the rest of the episode, right? You know, she, she's terrible about that. Well, that's what we got here. So already we know he is going to be exalted, but how? Everyone's forgotten about. That's where I want to get into some, some application points, and as always, I want to climax with Jesus, okay? I think, I think it's really cool what we have here. So, first of all, oh, I forgot to. So, there they are, all up there. Circumstances do not determine our, the command from God to be faithful. Joseph has every reason to choose bitterness over faithfulness. Here he is at the lowest point in his life. He's still a slave, but he's a prisoner as well. And he has served these men faithfully. And he asks not for money, he asks for justice. And he's forgotten. Contrast Joseph with Naomi. When Naomi loses her husband and, and, and sons, rightly so, she is angry and she's hurt. And she chooses bitterness. Joseph doesn't. He remains faithful. Your circumstances do not determine the command of God on your life to be faithful and godly. Secondly, notice that God is with Joseph in the pit. We already talked about that from chapter 39. It's hard for us to see it now, even for the reader. That's the beauty of the story. Is, is that the writer didn't remind us that God is with him in the pit. They don't really even mention him other than God is the interpreter of dreams. He's not really in the story. But we've been told not to forget that God is with him in the pit. But he is there. He's with him in the pit. And it isn't until hindsight that Joseph sees it. Thirdly, to be forgotten is not the same to be forsaken. Joseph is forgotten. He is not forsaken. We put those two ideas together. The world can abandon us. Friends and family can hurt us. It doesn't mean we've been forsaken by our God. Too often, that is the mistake we make in our spiritual lives. Joseph has been forgotten at the end of the story. 
But as we already know, because we've, we've read, we're familiar with the story, is he hasn't been forsaken by God. The rest of the world has, but God hasn't. We need to cling to that hope before we get these feelings of forsakenness. Only one person has ever been forsaken by God, and that is Jesus upon the cross. Now, I can't explain to you how all that worked in the mystery of the Trinity, but we should take Jesus at his word. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And citing Psalm 22, verse 1, saying that the entire psalm is fulfillment in that act of the cross. Christ was forsaken so that we don't have to be. Speaking of Jesus, uh, that is not the main connection we have with Jesus in, in the story. Uh, I find this fascinating. Is the way the story is told, it's, it's as if it's anticipating Jesus. There are some themes that we are shown here that will show up later in the story of Jesus. First of all, let us say that Jesus is a true and better cupbearer and baker. Consider some of the parallels we have. The two men are presented as having both bread and wine. Did you notice that? It's not the first time we've seen this in Genesis. Go back and read the story of Melchizedek. Remember after Abraham uh, lays the smack down on all those bad guys? And Melchizedek, the king of Salem, uh, future Jerusalem, shows up, and he comes bearing bread and wine. And there Abraham offers a tenth to the king of Jerusalem. And we, we, we pointed that out at the time. Like, isn't that an interesting detail, bread and wine? Here, we see two men, one who makes bread, the other who delivers wine. I don't think that's an accident. One man, the baker, he is cursed in death. How is he cursed in death? By the hanging on a tree. The other is raised to life by being restored to a position of prominence. Jesus embodies both of them in his experience. He is both cursed by the hanging of the tree outside the city gates, and then he is laid into a pit, a tomb, a place of death, only to be exalted at the right hand of the throne of the Father, where he was for eternity past. And notice, all of this happened on the third day. Isn't that cool? Isn't that cool? It's almost as if the writer of Genesis was anticipating Jesus, though he didn't know the name or the story. But I also want to show that, in many ways, I think Joseph mirrors the thief on the cross. When Joseph, uh, instead of asking for payment, he instead asks for one simple thing. He asks for the cupbearer, the one that will be exalted to the right hand of the throne of the king, to remember him. When he returns to his kingdom. The prayer of the thief. Was simple. When you come into your kingdom. Remember me. Joseph an enslaved. Prisoner. The thief. Is a prisoner too. It's almost like the Bible was written. By God himself. <laughs> with, with Jesus right there in the middle. Right. You've heard me quote Luther, the Bible is the cradle wherein Christ is laid. So we look at the story, and we see Joseph, and we see his travails, and we see his suffering. But we have to look at Christ. We know that God is with us in the pit because God himself went into the pit on our behalf. And he has conquered the grave, and he reigns supreme. And that is why we know that to be forgotten is not to be forsaken. For he promised that he will be with us. To the end of the age. All right, Danny, we miss anything? Well, yeah. <laughs> it, you know, when I looked at you know, the way the butler treated <coughs> Joseph, right. had a picture of how Jesus is, uh, Joseph is a type of Jesus. Mm -hmm. right? That's the way he was human to but as long as he's working, God is helping us and blessing us, giving us the things we ask for. Once he did them, we just tend to forget about him and go back on and there he was. Mm -hmm. So it's just another picture. Yeah. People yeah. Yeah. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. It's kind of what we'll talk about Sunday morning. Uh, we'll finish out chapter 8, Lord willing. Um, Solomon goes into the presence of God, but then he has to lead his people out to the light. And it's easy for us to forget or to take for granted. Yeah, that's good. Anything else? I don't know if I may read it or not, but you're, at the first you talked about the uh, captain of the guard. Mm -hmm. It says that these two guys were put in. 
Terry was casting the guard in his house. Yeah. In other words, I guess it was in the basement where they were casting. He's got the house up on top. Yeah. By the safe. Yeah, I know that too. Does Potiphar live in the parsonage of the prison? I don't know. That's what it sounds like. Yeah. The other thing too, I, I thought this since the first time we went through here a few weeks ago, that Potiphar was skeptic of his wife's accusation or he would have killed Joseph on the spot. I, th I think if you read between the lines, there may be some truth to that. Because, I mean, he'd been married to this woman for quite a while. He knew if she was lying or not. But he didn't want to embarrass her. Yeah. Better yeah. Yeah. I, yeah. I mean, all, you're left with reading between the lines, yeah. which can be dangerous. But yeah. of course, the real answer is God providentially put him in prison and not ex executed. God preserved his life. But yeah. You know, talking about God, saying like God wrote this, uh, I know that this is some student talking that, like, well, this is poetry. Like that doesn't have the same weight as statements, I guess. You mean like this part of Genesis? No, no. They, they the, say the, the first part? Something they're studying and say, well, this is all poetry. Oh, okay. What's that got to do with the price of eggs? Right. God writes poetry? Great. Well, he did. It's called Psalms. <laughs> um, there, there are those um, in the early chapters of Genesis, first 11 chapters, they'll say, are not historical, it's poetic. There are poetic elements to it. Yeah. Um, in fact, there's actual poetry. It's when uh, Adam says, you are bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh. Right, that's poetry. There are poetic elements. Day one corresponds with day four. Day two corresponds with day five, day three. In fact, there's poetic elements. But poetry is still true. Yep. Uh, um, now, it, it, the way it's expressed, and it may be exaggerated truth or something like that, um, but it, it's, it's still, still can be used for truth. Don, you, the other Don, you had some? Yes. Uh, Joseph didn't have to tell the baker the truth about the dream. Yeah. And he could have just told him that Nathaniel was with him. That's what I would have done to make some money, you know. But also that kind of tells us that we shouldn't uh, hold back the truth from other people when yeah. they were living in a sinful lifestyle. Yeah. We shouldn't say, oh, that's okay. His, Go his, along with it. his integrity required him to speak the truth, even if it was hurtful. You know, you're talking about making up what you saw in the ark. Yeah. That's what Nebuchadnezzar accused his wife of. Yeah. Yeah. Up as it goes. So you just need time so you can make up a good story. Yeah. Yeah. And and it's good you mentioned Nebuchadnezzar because the story of Daniel, in many ways, uh, parallels Joseph. I, I've shown this before. He uh, he goes down into the pit, the den of lions, and he he experiences resurrection, interpreting dreams. Uh, I mean, the Mene Mene Teko Parson that Mark read from Sunday morning is Daniel interpreting what no one else could interpret. And that's what Joseph is about to do for Pharaoh. Daniel did it for Belshazzar. Joseph does it for uh, Pharaoh. That's good stuff. Isn't it amazing? Like, when I started chapter 40, I thought, oh, <laughs> yeah, there's nothing here. There's this nothing here. But then when you read it, it's, it's, you realize it's God's word. Every word is given by inspiration of God and for our benefit and exhortation, uh, encouragement. So, okay, let's get out a little early. How does that sound? Unless you got any other thoughts. Um, all right. Well, Danny, since y'all going to be heading out soon, abandoning us to go see your first grandbaby, I tell you. Selfish? I tell you what, it's <laughs> awful, eh?